Historia Canadiana is recorded on the unceded lands of the Kanyankaheka First Nation. Hello everyone and welcome to Historia Canadiana, the show where two tired boys talk about Canadian literature, culture, and history, and sometimes go with these really weird concepts like this episode today and see what happens. With me, as always, is my co-host, Mackenzie. Yo! <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to our, uh, about our show to a professor of mine at McGill, actually, who's very like, he's like, oh, cool. You don't see that often in like podcasts or any kind of interesting in like Canadian culture and literature anymore. So he thought our idea was cool. <laughs> eh, we do what we do. There you go. So... Before we get started, obviously we like to thank the patrons that keep the show running, right? Uh, and if you want to support the show, consider subscribing. Uh, at three dollars a month, you get an extra show per month by Mackenzie and I, uh, mostly driven by Mackenzie. And yeah, it's all about pop culture. So if you want pop more culture modern... in Canada, therefore it's called Pop Canada. <laughs> Subtlety <Genius>. died. <laughs> Subtlety is dead, and it was killed by Mackenzie. <laughs> I burned it with fire. <laughs> I did really enjoy our last episode, though. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, without further ado, what the hell are we talking about today? I don't know. You tell me. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to lead this episode. So, okay. Uh, I guess I'll just wing it then. So, I was reading this really interesting book the other day called... Wait, you read? I, I still am one of those rare breeds of people who read, yes. You don't use audible.com? <laughs> our non-sponsor this week but hey if audible someone from audible is listening definitely we'll take your money i don't care if you're owned by amazon fuck my yeah. morals yeah so, morals don't put food on the plate exactly anyway so i was reading this book right um if it helps it was a digital edition so i guess it's kind of i'm not that much of a dinosaur that it was a paper edition and it's called Fear and Temptation, the Image of the Indigene in Canada, New Zealand, and Australian Literature, which was written by Terry Goldie in the late 80s. As you can tell by the title, it's a bit of an older book, but it's definitely worth a read um, because it kind of addresses the perception in a lot of these literatures, mostly written by white men, of indigenous populations, right? And he kind of touches upon this idea and innovates on this idea of what he calls white indigenization in it, which kind of informed the subject of this episode. So white indigenization is this idea that settlers, right, mostly from white populations, would adopt what they perceived as indigenous traits. So uh, as it pertains to, for example, perceptions in mysticism, connections to the land, sexuality, etc., and adopt them and adapt them as their own in order to, you know, create themselves as true natives of, in this case, Canada, right? Um, it's a really interesting idea. I'm not really doing it much justice here in like the five minutes that, I, that I'm condensing it down into, but there is a section in the book where he talks about Newfoundland specifically, right? Mm -hmm. And more particularly, the indigenous population of Newfoundland, the Beotok, right? So today... I want to talk about that population, the Beotuk, and their relation to Newfoundland as a colony and eventual dominion that would create its own sense of nativeness that was distinct from Canada. Right? And I want to talk about that because Newfoundland has an interesting relation to Canada as something separate. And I think it's very much informed by perceptions of like, indigenous populations like the Beotuk. Again, like I was telling Mac before the start of this recording, I have no idea if there's any ground to hold on this. This is really just, I'm swinging for the fences with this one. There you go. So <laughs> I what mean, you swinging for? Say it for us right now. What is your thesis? My thesis is that the disappearance, I guess, spoiler alert, of the Beotuk informed the idea of Newfoundland as a nation that was separate from Canada. Okay. And I will explain this thesis by first talking about the Beotuk, then talking about where Newfoundland meets, well, Newfoundlanders, white Newfoundlanders meet the Beothook in their literature, and finally by talking about Newfoundland and its relation to confederation and how a lot of those same ideas come back. 
was Newfoundland the one that joined really, really late, or is that a different place? Yes, Newfoundland is indeed the one that joined really late Confederation in like 1949. 19, 1849? 1949. 1949. Oh, okay. Yeah, because yeah, 1849 Confederation wouldn't have happened yet. Yeah, exactly. They, they were so late to Confederation that they were early to it. <laughs> so late and went back around in a circle. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, but that's not to say that there weren't attempts to join Newfoundland to Confederation before that, right? As we'll remember, Newfoundland had actually participated in some of the conferences that mm -hmm. led, uh, that were debating uh, Confederation, even if they participated from a distance, right? They were mostly observers. And that kind of debate would continue for decades, right? Almost a century after Confederation. Yeah, um, a century after Confederation. And a century and a half after Confederation. <laughs> Get your facts straight, Mac. Be better at math. So anyway, do you know anything or have you even ever heard of the Beothuk population? No. Okay, great. So if ever you, uh, have you actually, I guess the place where I would maybe see them uh, as, or at least see that you would have a, a perception of them. Have you ever seen Newfoundland and Labrador's coat of arms? No. Okay, great. So we're starting from zero, I guess, because oh, they yeah. are... <laughs> The Beothuk are actually on Newfoundland's coat of arms. I know, know nothing. Great. Which means that I can for once say that I know everything, and that feels satisfying. So the Beothuk um, were hunters, fishers, food gatherers who lived in what we now know as Newfoundland, right? The island. Mm -hmm. They, I think they, there were some that did go a bit, uh, that were a bit on Labrador or in Labrador, what we now know as Labrador, but... Mostly, they they contain themselves to Newfoundland, right? And what I was telling Mac before the before we started recording is these populations are actually the first to have encountered settlers in what we now know as Canada, right? So when people like John Cabot arrived on the shores of Newfoundland in 1497, he would have encountered the Beothuk, right? And the Beothuk are who are where the actual term Red Indian comes from, right? So mm -hmm. it's been kind of used throughout, well, most of Canada's modern history, right? In reference to all indigenous populations, right? The Redskins or whatever. Well, that's all North America in general. Really. Yes, right. I would say so. I don't know if it, no, I don't think it's something that would pertain to South American indigenous populations. No, I'm I don't think so. North American. Right. So... Yeah, exactly. So North American populations, but there's actually a historical origin for that term. And it's in the Beothuk who used a kind of red marking on their face, right, as a symbolic and ceremonial gesture, right, as a sign of tribal identity. And yeah, so literally they had faces that were painted red. And so the term just kind of stuck after in reference to all indigenous mm. populations in North America. Oh. It's kind of sad that a tribal, a sign of tribal identity like that would kind of be used for blatant racism after and a dis mark of distinction, but I'd expect nothing less for purveyors of colonialism. So it's kind of debated, as many things are from this time, where uh, or when, rather, the Beotuk arrived mm -hmm. in Newfoundland, but it can confidently be traced back to about 400 AD, right? Um, there are some ancestral... Uh, like relationships that are claimed to have gone further back, right? But it's getting a bit sketchy at that point. It's very difficult to say, right? So they did have relationships with other native populations, namely the Inu in Labrador. And and by the time that the Europeans would arrive in the early fifty in the late fifteenth century, right? Any kind of strife that they would have had with the Inu had been gone or would have been resolved relatively quickly. Right? Now, the Beothuk themselves didn't actually number that many. There were only about five to 700 of them by the time that the Europeans arrived, um, which is perhaps unsurprising considering the small territory on which they were. Um, I don't know, but that's, uh, that's the world in which they lived in. And they mostly relied on caribou, salmon, and seal, right? They had some experience with hunting with bow and arrows, and they basically were a mix of Inuit populations and what we kind of consider lower St. Lawrence uh, indiv uh, indigenous populations, right? Kind of a cultural mix of the two or what we'd imagine as the two. Right? 
Um, contrary to a lot of indigenous populations, they would actually never adopt any of the um, European practices of like guns or clothing. They would kind of maintain their own steadfast cultural practices until their demise, right? Uh, because again, spoiler, when you're facing a population of five or 700 people against viruses, guns, and starvation, it's kind of hard to last very long, right? Um, so again, in reference to um, their kind of mixed cultural baggage, right? They would actually live in multi-sided subterranean winter dwellings, right? So it's kind of like a, how do you call that? Damn, what the Inuit build. Jesus, my mind is oh. escaping me. So Help me. Like a type of hut? Yes, but like the ice one. Jesus, thank you. <laughs> what? <laughs> Patrick, come on, you live in one. We all do in Canada. That's true, I'm sorry. <laughs> We all live in igloos and we go and ride moose. Yep. Uh, sometimes dog sled to work um, if the moose is unavailable. I like to take a whole flock of meese. One of my students actually used that the other day and I was so <laughs> happy. <laughs> <laughs> but it makes sense. Anyway, we're not going to get into like linguistics here, but damn, I love meese as a term. <laughs> so they would have like these sub semi-subterranean winter dwellings mm -hmm. and they would also have a language, however, that was unlike that of the Inuit. So it's probably closely related to Algonquian, right? So again, just kind of this middle ground um, population that takes from a bit of everywhere. So after John Cabot, like I said, landed in Newfoundland in 1497, oh, so, so only a year after good guy Columbus, I guess. Ugh, damn it. <clears throat> yeah, really. Dickhead. Yeah. Honestly, I, oh God, fucking Columbus. Anyway. Fucking colonists. <laughs> but I mean, even at the time, wasn't Columbus considered like a real shit even by colonist standards? He was fucking crazy. Yeah, he was smoking crack when he was doing this. Yo, the man was on cocaine. <laughs> the man was on crack cocaine. That's a historical fact. Don't look it up. Just believe us. Anyway. It is not fake news. <laughs> so... Um, despite like the contact that John Cabot would make in Newfoundland, the Beothuk themselves were not particularly often encountered. Again, relatively small population. It's kind of easy to avoid um, mm. any kind of encounter. Um, but by 1612, as people encroached more and more onto Newfoundland's soil, for example, and into Canada, people like John Guy were were actively trading with them in places like Trinity Bay and increased settlements by colonists, and even encroachment by Mi'kmaq populations who had, um, who had united with, I think, the English, if I'm not mistaken, just going off of memory here, actually would drive them further into the western part of Newfoundland, right? Right. So once, um, you know, after that, you basically see a very typical situation happening in which Settlers overhunt, overfish. Uh, there is a significant diminution of resources. Fucking settlers. <sighs> yeah. They, I mean, like, what is there to say at this point? That's why I'm Watch kind of... your fucking resources, man. Take what <laughs> you need, nothing more. No, but I need to sell it and make a profit, dude. <laughs> <laughs> what profit? You live in the new world. There's no... Yo, cod was the shit. Like that, why, why do you think Newfoundland became such a prosperous colony for a while? Because there was full of cod, and it was and literally- And then they overfished, and now they don't have cod, and now they're not a prosperous colony. Right. But they don't know that. You're operating under the assumption that there is limited resources, but the colonists were operating under the fact that everything is unlimited. Yep. They're fucking idiots. Bunch of dumbasses. I mean, it gave rise to Christopher Columbus, so what would you expect? <laughs> I don't know, um, man. Sometimes I just, just sometimes I'm just, I'm just so done. Or uh, can we just be like the bear took and run away somewhere? Hi. <laughs> just exit this earth. <laughs> I feel like they had the right call. <laughs> just like not making contact for as long as possible. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes I just, sometimes that's what you gotta do. So basically, there was overhunting, overfishing. There was obviously some like, viral contact. Uh, mm -hmm. which didn't help, but apparently it didn't affect the Beotuk as much, perhaps because there were only at first some trading, um, some trading 
engagements going on and they moved as you were saying so the contact was still relatively limited um however these kind of overfishing and over like uh, over hunting practices because it diminished the resource base it kind of led to a lot of altercations and a vicious cycle of revenge would emerge mm-hmm. very early on um, or relatively early on by the 17th century right and it, to the point where the governor of Newfoundland um, or many governors would actually try to install proclamations that prohibited persecution of the Beotuk, right? They were like, it's got to stop, right? Yeah. This, this is not going well. We're still at a point where we need a lot of indigenous populations to survive. And like, we're, th- this is not going well, right? But as often happens, a lot of authorities in, um, the colonies and even in britain just completely ignored this and said fuck it just keep going yeah right. hey, fuck you we do what we want yep you're just a colony i don't care you don't know what's actually going on in this place that you live i living on my island thousands of miles away i truly know what the people need yep that's exactly this there you go you've just summed up the first 300 years of british colonization <laughs> in canada <laughs> any colonization yeah none really. of them are different no no i know i'm just saying because it's a, the context that we're talking about here so there were actual attempts at conciliation beyond this mm-hmm. right so for example lieutenant john cartwright in 1768 william cormac in 1822 they actually tried to engage with the beotuk but actually couldn't find them like expeditions were just unsuccessful at the basic requirement of finding the population that you're trying to um that you're trying to make peace with right um and eventually david buchans i think that's how you pronounce his name he uh the he would actually try also in the 19th century to make peace with the Beotuk, but that ended in tragedy because the Beotuk actually killed two of his Marines. So there were, uh, there is like an actually interesting story right uh, here. So there are actually offers of bounties for any kind of captives, right? And that kind of served as a mediator, right? Okay. Um, And this, unfortunately resulted in several people, including Beotuk and uh, colonists, being captured. And among the Beotuk who were captured, in 1819, we have one called Dimas Duet, and in 1823, one called Shana Dithit. I, again, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, especially Shana Dithit. You see many spellings for her name, right? And I want to mention Shana Dithit because not only in the current time that we're talking, but much later, actually in the 1970s in Newfoundland, she would kind of become this symbol, right, um, of the Beotuk, mm-hmm. mostly because she is literally considered to be the last Beotuk, right? Um, we will return to Dimas Duet uh, later in the episode when we talk more cultural elements, but... Shana Dithit is really interesting, and we will most certainly come back to her in later episodes when we talk about like later Newfoundland literature, uh, sure. because she would be a central focus of so much of it. So Shana Dithit would actually survive her capture, but she would die in 1829. And as a cultural entity from that moment, the Beotuk would by then cease to exist. Right. right. There are some uh, people who claimed to be um, Beotuk uh, after that. And we have a link in the description to a song by a certain Santutoni, Ooh. right? Um, which was recorded in 1910, right? And Santutoni is actually someone who claimed that her father was Beotuk, right? But again, if any, it's a bit hard to say because obviously genetics were not a thing really back then, but. Mm-hmm. Considering that her claims are, like, if we're taking for granted that her claims are factually correct, right, and are real, she would be among the last as well, right? But again, as an entity, as a cultural thing, the Beotuk just really ceased to exist by 1829, right? I don't know, did you actually listen to Santu's song, which I linked to? Uh, no, I only just got in, gotta remember. Right, that's true. So let's see. I'll play it. It's only like a minute long. Let's see if it actually works and has it record, so... This was recorded in 1910. Can you hear it? Um, yeah, I am. I can hear it. Thank you. 
So I'll stop it there. But what's kind of interesting with this is that Santu herself did not know the meaning of the words. Uh, that had already been lost by the time she was singing the, the words. She was born in 1837. By then, she would have been among the last. Um, and so it is kind of difficult to verify, mostly because there's very little that we know about the Beotuk language, right? Um, but it is an interesting piece of history nonetheless, right? Um, and is kind of, I think, emblematic of the way that a lot of people in Newfoundland saw the Beotuk, right? As yeah. this thing that's difficult to define, but that exists as a cultural thing that eventually disappeared. Right? Did you have anything that you wanted to add, perhaps, or maybe questions about the Beotuk? Um, well, as much as we're going to be talking about it as... Mm -hmm a mystery i do want to highlight that there, this is almost a kind of tragedy as well oh for sure yeah beyond the loss of people for sure but also the loss of like this loss of culture that we have and it's also very indicative of a bias you still see with western history history is only slowly changing about oral history yep. like because we see in the song only the lyrics don't we, we don't know what they meant because of the fact that the language was lost and therefore a lot of oral history, a lot of oral stories are lost. Yeah, absolutely. So I find it a really kind of fascinating thing when we're talking about, because we are historic Canadiana, but all of our history is based on written yep. very largely. And even when we do have these songs, we can't, we don't even know what it's about. It's more right. just about the interesting nature of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Which is really kind of stupid because we do know for a fact that the oral history that these people performed was a lot more strict and stringent than we thought. Yeah, absolutely. And the written word is very malleable to change with things like separate editions and such. Or translations. Translations. Like, especially when we're dealing with indigenous populations. Yeah. So, so I think there's a really kind of fascinating part to see about the Beotuk. We only know so little, not just because they were all killed out, but also because there is such a culture clash. Yeah. Absolutely. That's something, there's an interesting article, which again, I'll link to, um, by a woman called Suzanne Owen, who wrote an article called The Demise of the Beotuk as a past still present. Mm -hmm. um, and it, she touches upon some of the ideas that you're talking about here as this emblem, if you will, of the continuous erasure that's being done while also still being, I guess, palimpsestic in a sense, where there's always a trace left of these populations, yeah. but that we can't quite make out what it is. And so there's always this disconnection that happens, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting intervention on your end. Absolutely. <laughs> So in terms of like shifting towards Newfoundland and back into our continuity, right, as we were establishing it before, um, you'll remember that, as we mentioned at the beginning of the episode, Newfoundland did not join Confederation, right? Okay. It decided against it at first. Right, 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 right. right absolutely. Um, and there was some interest in Confederation in the 1860s, mostly as a means of economic diversification, right? But ultimately, Newfoundland and Labrador decided that, you know what? we can do this on our own. We can do our own railway and we can develop our own resources and, you know, we'll have our own manufacturing that'll be protected, <laughs> which to an extent was actually not wrong, right? Uh, at first, at least. Um, especially in a world in which Canada hadn't expanded to the point that it was at today, right? When we're still considering Canada as like the very limited British North American colonies, right, of southern Quebec and southern Ontario and the Maritimes, yeah, Newfoundland was still a pretty big deal, right? But obviously, as Canada would expand west and become bigger and have, Better. yeah, in a sense, yeah, absolutely, and have like its own economic diversification, Newfoundland almost seemed like small fry compared to it, and it became very difficult to compete uh, in this world, mm -hmm. right, as its own little thing. So there would actually be a pro-Confederation government, um, which had been led by Pr Frederick Bowker Tarrington Carter. Boy, that's a mouthful. Um, <laughs> and they actually were in power at the time of the Confederation of Canada, right, um, and would continue to stay in power after 1867 not because of any interest by the majority of the population of Newfoundland in Confederation itself, 
but mostly because its economic policies were good for Newfoundland in general, and they were pretty like cautiously building towards confederation, right? They were pro-confederation insofar as they were acting with Newfoundland's best interests going into confederation, not just saying like, fuck it, let's do it now, right? Do it live! Right. <laughs> I mean, that was a fair point to have, though. Confederation was a big topic. I wasn't really sure what to do. And, you know, Lower Canada and Upper Canada, Quebec and Ontario, they knew what their place in Confederation would be. They mm -hmm. knew what that was understood for them. It was fine. Yeah. But in the Maritimes, as we talked about in earlier episodes, it wasn't entirely sure what was going on. And they yeah. didn't really get what their place would be. Absolutely. And there was like a bit of a sense of pride, of national pride that was already forming and as we'll kind of talk about in Newfoundland specifically. And you see this in Nova Scotia as well uh, when we were talking about people like Joseph Howe, mm -hmm. who had the like similar arguments of saying like, but like, what about our own identities, right? We're not the same as Quebec or Ontario. Why would we join into this? No, only Quebecers and French Quebecers get to have their own unique identity in Canada. <laughs> They're the only ones allowed. God damn it. You had to go there, didn't you? Just I'm sorry. Like I get like I get why they were angry, but that seems to be a lot of the time what happens, you know? Yeah. Ultimately that's kind of what happens. Yeah. Unfortunately. Although for a long time, like that's uh, that's perhaps a bit unfair. It's perhaps not legislated, but it still to this day you can see differences in cultural practices in the Maritimes versus Ontario and Newfoundland. Oh, and for stuff sure, like that. right? For sure, it's just not legislated culture. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Which I can understand why it would be legislated in Quebec at least, right? Because for historical reasons and geographic reasons, but sometimes you're right; it is a bit much. <laughs> anyway, that's not the episode for this. Um, and by 1869, there was actually a deal for Newfoundland to enter Confederation, which was pretty much going forward, right? It was pretty darn close. Mm -hmm. But then the anti-Confederationists, which were led by Charles Fox Bennett, decided, no, enough's enough. And they just upped their game to 11 and managed to push public sentiment slowly to their side. Right, <laughs> which would lead to actually one of the most heated elections in Newfoundland up until that date, right? Um, and would probably only be repeated once Newfoundland again would elect to re-enter Confederation in the twenty in the nineteen forties. Sorry. So on the one hand, you had the pro-Confederationists who argued for the advantages of lower prices for goods, right, and um, basically kept their same economic arguments, right. And they had the support of the governor of Newfoundland on their side, right? Sir Anthony Musgrave, who was okay. British and who obviously had a vested interest in confederating uh, the, his colony with the rest of Canada, because again, it would be administratively easier. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's ultimately what confederation is. <laughs> it's just like, it's easier to govern, so like, fuck it. <laughs> so the anti-confederationists, however, took a bit of a broader approach. And while they did argue the pro-confederationists on the idea of economics, right, saying that the fishermen and their boats would be faced with high taxes, um, as well as the idea that Newfoundland would be dragged into Canadian wars that they didn't necessarily want to fight, right? Um, literally one of the, I think this was Bennett himself who said that Newfoundlanders would be forced to quote, shed their blood and leave their bones to bleach in a foreign land in defense of the Canadian line of boundary, <laughs> which is a horrifying image to imagine. <laughs> And again, in fact, he's not entirely wrong, right? Like, by joining Confederation, yes, you would join Canadian wars. Like, yep, that's that would be sure, a thing. You, you gotta, gotta get in for the fights, man. I mean, that's just part of it. And in for a penny, in for a pound. <laughs> of flesh. Anyway. Woo! Let's go. But the, the idea behind it, right, is that, the, again, similar to what you would actually see in places like Quebec during, for example, the First World War, in which you'd have a strong anti-conscription um, uh, movement, right? A lot of Newfoundlanders were like, yeah, like the econom economic argument sounds perhaps good, but it's true that I don't really care about fighting wars abroad. Mm. Like, and I don't necessarily want to fight for the interests of people that I don't really know, right? Who would? Right. Like, or if I'm going to go to war, I might as well go for a war that I agree with and the rest of my Newfoundlander community agrees with, right? Rather than some people in Ontario, right? 
which again is kind of like a basic argument of most provincialism, right? That you see in Canada of like, why would I care about what people do in Alberta, right? So, but the Newfoundlanders actually operated on that rather than joining Confederation and then backtracking. Right? Nice. Um, but, and here's where you get the classic in terms of, well, most settler nations, the anti-confederationists also played on Newfoundlanders pride in being Britain's oldest colony. And what uh -huh. form did that take is a freaking healthy dose of racism and anti-French sentiments. Woohoo! Let's go. Um, Let's yeah. piss off the French again. It, it's kind of exactly what you what you always see. It's like we're not we're not joining with those like half-assed people, right? Who don't want to be like everyone else. Says the person who doesn't want to be like everyone be else. Like different. What? That's uh, people. You're like other people. I don't yep. know what to tell you. I We're know. all kind of the fucking same. Yeah, but no, my culture is different than yours. So screw you. So fucking dumb. Yeah. So it led to actually this whole thing uh, would actually rile people up quite a bit, right? and would you know lead to some uh, to some art actually being created around this. Um, so I don't know if you actually had the chance to look at the anti-confederation song, which I linked to. So while you're looking for that, um, I will read out a part of it because it's quite interesting and deals back with some of this idea. It, this is where we'll kind of come back to the idea of the Beotuk and this idea of creating a native population of Newfoundland. Now that there is literally no native population, right? So it starts here. The song is, Ye brave Newfoundlanders who plow the salt sea with hearts like the eagle so bold and so free. The time is at hand when we'll have to say if confederation will carry the day. Men hurrah for our own native isle, Newfoundland. Not a stranger shall hold one inch, one inch of its strand. Her face turns to Britain, her back to the Gulf. Come near at your peril, Canadian wolf. <laughs> cheap molasses, cheap tea and molasses they say they will give. All taxes taken off that the poor man may live. Cheap nails and cheap lumber are coffins to make, and homespun to mend our old clothes when they break. If they take off all the taxes, how then will they meet the heavy expenses on army and fleet? Just give them the chance to get into the scrap. They'll show you the trick with pen, ink, and red tape. That one doesn't sound right, but okay. Would you barter the right that your fathers have won, your freedom transmitted from father to son, for a few thousand dollars Canadian gold? Don't let it be said that our birthright was sold. Thoughts? Okay, um... I don't know. There's a lot, there's a... There's a lot to unpack in this one. <laughs> yeah. This is in the poems of Robert Lowell, or...? No, the, this is the Anti-Confederation song, the first link at the top, uh, uh. by Edith Felt. Ah, uh, yes, okay. I, well, because we've talked about propaganda before, you know? Yep, sure. So this is nothing new. No. There's really nothing different going on. There's almost, oh, hold on. Yeah, there's, there's almost a kind of American sentiment talking about taxes. Okay, interesting. Yeah, go for it. Well, cheap tea and molasses, they say they will give. All taxes taken off, that poor man may live. Cheap nails and cheap lumber are coffins to make. All homespun to moan our old clothes when they break. So almost positioning themselves as in, like, they, if they take off all taxes, how then will they meet? Because in America, they got taxed too much. Right. And so that was the idea. You come to the new land, don't get taxed as much. So Newfoundland's almost positioning itself on the side of Britain in that scenario. Right. Like, we, we, we need to get taxed. Absolutely. You guys, this is how we do it. Mm -hmm. But we need <laughs> Newfoundland was like, nah. <laughs> or at least if, if we're going to be taxed, like, it might as well go for towards our own benefit, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. As opposed, so you see, that's always a familiar sound I find with these like songs of confederation and independence. Because at the end of the day, that's what people really care about: mm -hmm. the economy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the economy. <laughs> just that like small little thing, but it is kind of like just kind of coming back to the whole thesis of uh, this episode, right? This it's interesting, right? That there's already this relation to the land that's being expressed of like, we have a, we're children of this land. We're children of this soil, right? Relating it to the eagle, right? Soaring free or, you know, men hurrah for our own native isle, Newfoundland, mm -hmm. right? And there is, oh, there's so much irony, I think in this one where 
Not a stranger shall hold one inch of its strand, right? Her face turns to Britain, her back to the Gulf. So this whole idea of like facing an invader yeah. is, is just to me so perfect, especially considering the subject that we're talking about today, right? Of who is this native person, right? Well, who is this native, but also like, because this song is anti-Confederation, correct? Yes. Who's the invader at this point? If they're face to Britain, back to the Gulf, are, are they afraid Britain's going to take over? No, face to Britain is like, we, we look towards you and, well, at least that's the way I, I saw it, right? And she's turning, she, Newfoundland, is turning her back to the Gulf of Quebec and things like to that. To her enemy. Right, right. Like, d- be gone, right? I'm not even going to acknowledge your existence. Oh, right? okay. I saw that as letting themselves get stabbed in the back. Okay. Ooh, okay. That could be, that could be. I can see that. I'm you kind know, of thinking also, a bit more simple in this case, just because it would be a bit of a popular song. Yeah. But yeah. I don't know. But you're right. Like, yeah, stabbed in the back could work. But and, again, with hearts like the eagle, so bold and so free. That's uh, America. Come on. <laughs> that's America. I always love that, that the Americans adopted the eagle, even though there are more eagles in Canada. <laughs> but now that we're looking back on it. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You, you can't say, like, eagle freedom in the same line. You can't say that there's in some kind of sentiment. Yeah. Or is it absolutely. they're making the big struggle for independence while still being a colony of the British Empire? <laughs> like, yeah. Newfoundland was there. We want our independence. Okay, so from Britain too? No. No! And I insist on only becoming a dominion in 1908, like 50 years after Canada. <laughs> ah, genius. Right. But it, it, it does kind of, yeah, I, I just thought it would be interesting to, to, to bring up this song as a kind of introduction to the kind of dualities that are playing, that are being played in Newfoundland, right? Um, and especially this whole idea of the resources that are being used and stuff like that, like who gets to use those resources that very much plays into this whole song, right? So ultimately, in the very heated election of 1869, right, the anti-Confederation would actually, would absolutely crush the, the, right. the pro-Confederations, right? They would win by a landslide. And many Confederates were actually very bitter about this. And this might sound familiar, claimed that the election had been carried, quote, by means of the most fraudulent and flag- flagitious, flagitious? Ooh, that's, ooh. Yeah. Um, they argued that the results did not represent, quote, the rational and dispassionate judgment of the community, and therefore was not a true verdict. <laughs> that one sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that one, I, I couldn't resist putting that in the notes because, goddamn, history repeats itself sometimes, folks. <laughs> history repeats itself, but it's also just one of those fascinating things that you people just can't seem to stop talking about. Mm-hmm. Where it's like, these things didn't, it's not like it's new. It's just much more prevalent now. Right. Absolutely. Or at least we're more yeah. aware of it. Yeah. And apparently Governor Hill uh, did actually agree with this assessment. And he tried to convince the colonial office that there were uh, that there was evidence of like these really rowdy elections in some of the counties like Brigus, right? Mm-hmm. And he suggested to certain people that Newfoundland be thrust into confederation by imperial order in council, right? So that fuck the elections, you're going into confederation regardless, right? Right. Ultimately, London didn't really react to any of this, right? And neither did Ottawa. No one really seemed to care whether Newfoundland joined or not. Like We're who- not joining. Okay, <laughs> cool. Okay, thanks. Thanks for hey, letting bye. me know. <laughs> like, okay, fam, thanks for that. But like, it seemed like, okay, they're kind of like this isolated island. Whether they join us or not, meh, it doesn't really change much. We can still have some kind of interaction with them. And ultimately, for the British Empire, Newfoundland, you're really not a linchpin in this case, Mm -hmm. right? You're a port of entry, but whether you're connected to Canada or not, doesn't really matter, right? Mm -hmm. Which, again, just to kind of bring it back to this whole idea of creating an indigenous or a concept of indigeneity, right, that's completely dissociated from any real native population, right? It's kind of interesting to me that you have this moment in which the Newfoundlanders are kind of treated in many ways as non-entities, right? Which in itself feeds into this idea of 
well, then we have to distinguish ourselves, right? As something politically independent or culturally independent. So it kind of becomes this Newfoundland circle. has to be its own independent culture. Right. Cool. Are you still going to do trade? Sure. Uh, yeah. Right. So anyway, it, that would pretty much be the status quo uh, after 1869 for some time in Newfoundland. In the 1890s, the colony would actually suffer uh, quite significantly in its economy, right? It suffered a bank crash. Uh, by 1895, because of it, there was renewed interest into Confederation, right, as a solution for their financial troubles. But because it, by this point, Canada offered much less favorable financial terms than Newfoundland actually wanted, no deal was really reached. And this one didn't really go anywhere as, a, as an attempt, right? So what I thought we could do, right, is to kind of go over specific cultural items that kind of explain what I was what I was going for at the beginning of this episode. So now that we've kind of had the two sides of the coin, Newfoundland by the 1890s, right, and the Beotuk as the symbol of a lost people, right, and there's this very real lost people, I think it would be kind of interesting to go over some of the art that was put out between the time the Beotuk were went extinct and the time that Newfoundland was kind of establishing itself as its own thing, okay. right? The first one I want to bring up, and this comes back to uh, Desma Duet, right, who was the one of the Beotuk who was captured, right? Um, I thought it would be kind of interesting to look at a painting, right, that was done at this point of this person. So... What is the painting, actually, Mac? It'll be linked, but how would you describe it? Uh, it's very almost impressionist. Lots of lines, lots of quick lines. Okay. It gives it an almost, like, fur quality. Mm -hmm. It's of, I guess, of a Beotuk person, I'm guessing. Yeah, so that's supposed to be Isma Duet herself, the person mm -hmm. who was captured. Right? It's not, like, it's actually a very pretty painting. Yep, absolutely. Nothing really insulting it, you know? Right, Absolutely. There has been also a lot of interpretations of it by art critics and art historians as kind of like the Mona Lisa of Newfoundland, in a sense, <laughs> which, okay. which is kind of interesting uh, insofar as it's Weird kind of, comparison, but okay. I think the idea is like, it's this forever unknowable person, right? She kind of stands in mm -hmm. for this universal um, mm -hmm. of the Beotuk, and she's like staring back at the Newfoundlanders right? Um, kind of always offering this ambiguous look saying like, you know, kind of what you are right? in a sense. You know what you are. Right. It's, it's literally an image staring back at you, right? Because this was painted by a certain lady Hamilton, who was the wife of the governor at the time, right? And so it's very much the perception of a colonial master in this case of the Beotuk, right? Of this kind of pure symbol, this young lady of the Beotuk people and saying mm -hmm. like, this is me literally controlling what you look like. I have power over your legacy, right? As a population, right? right? And it's interesting to me that you, re you don't, you can't really tell much about what this culture is from this painting. There's no okay. background, right? At best, you can tell that they have fur coats on, right? <laughs> or at least coats made of fur, but like, there's no detail here. It's That's just, true. There's, there's no background. There's no... Yeah. It's just this young lady staring back at you, right? Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough as well, something to note, the painting is not actually called Desma Do It. What's it called? Right? Oh, Portrait of Desma Do It. Right. But it's, the people referred to her as Mary March, right? They rebaptized this person once they, she was painted. Right. As part of the Newfoundland way of adopting culture, right? I guess, right? Of saying like, hey. You shall subsume your culture. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of what I was aiming for in this case. Right? We're just like you guys. We're a culture on the verge of extinction. Yep, sure are. Or at least struggling for survival. Oh, yeah. yeah. That, sure, sure. That's what happens. No, but it is kind of interesting, right? So it's like you're hanging on to this image, or at least you find something very much of interest in this image of what by then was clearly understood as a dying people, right? Mm -hmm. 
Although the native has always been described as constantly disappearing, right? Uh, the Beotuk were actually disappearing. So there's an element of ethnology and anthropology that kind of goes into this, of preserving an image of what would be known as the Indian at the time, right? So I don't know, there's something just kind of interesting to me about this picture of representing how initially Europeans perceive themselves vis-a-vis -vis this painting, which was produced in 1819 right as needing to preserve it right but not going into too much depth i don't know did you have anything that you wanted to add about that one about the need to preserve this symbol or just like anything else that you wanted to add about this painting <laughs> um i do find the art style is rather interesting yeah if, it, for those who actually see it like there's very quick line work even on the face it all like there's a very almost choppy feel to it i guess mm -hmm. Which makes it kind of fascinating, and it's yeah. sort of a very, I think it's like a good portrayal of. If, if if we're talking like comparing to Mona Lisa, you can see some stark differences, and this one very much invokes more of a North American mindset. Of course, yeah. Although funny enough, again, like I do find it interesting. The back of lack of background is very interesting, just because, especially when you're creating an image of an indigenous population. Typically speaking, people from Western world, the Western world have seen them in connection with nature. Mm -hmm. right whereas well again i think that's part of the repossession though you're stripping away what actually made them first nation mm. like their most important connection is with nature so in this way you're taking that away from them right absolutely and again it's yeah i do see the also the impressionist elements that you were talking about before of like these quick brush strokes but like impressionists tended to have a very open sense right <clears throat> there were these wide worlds that they were portraying and open spaces mm -hmm. whereas Dismaduit in this case is very much portrayed in a confined setting right it's just her right all we can look at is this person and no other connection to any other person we don't even know who she's looking at right and so it becomes almost a universal as you're saying yeah <laughs> okay so moving forward a few years to just after the Beotuk have disappeared, right? I want to touch upon a poem that was published in what was known as the Newfoundland Patriot, right? um, which, funny enough, a poem about the Beotuk in the Newfoundland Patriot, um, which was published in 1831 by a person who is only known as, I'm regretting already uh, this because I know you're going to make a joke, the person is only known as PP. Yep, I knew it. You have a smile on your face. <laughs> so anyway. I didn't say anything. <laughs> okay. In 1831, so two years after the official or what is kind of recognized as when the Beotuk died as a cultural entity, this poet writes this poem, right? Um, which we're not going to read all of it, but there are some interesting passages nonetheless to bring up, right? Um, including the first few stanzas or the few three lines, I should say. Where are they, that red warrior band who reigned supreme in days of yore? Ere British ships had sought the strand, um, ere, Britain's f ere Britain's feet had stood the shore, had trod the shore. Where are they, that dark race who claimed pride? Oh, Jesus, it's so small. Oh, sorry. Who claimed proud lineage from the bolt of heaven, whose giant limbs were never chained. Right. So he goes on, right, um, in the second paragraph, in the second stanza. Mm -hmm. Where are they? I seek them by the shore of that bright lake, their forest born. But ah, they for, uh, their forms are seen no more, and all is desolate and lone. Their bones unburied strew the land. So you can already see a shift happening, right? Mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of romanticism going on in this poem. <laughs> um, so, and yeah, I just wanted to mention the very last line, right, um, of this poem is britain the tale shall be from age to age the foulest brought uh, the foulest blot upon thy history page right so he's just fucking calling out britain and saying like you just you literally annihilated these people yeah unfortunately this poet was not right about it being a particularly big blot on his, on britain's historical page yeah it's uh <laughs> it's it's uh <laughs> A footnote, perhaps? It's a minor, a minor point, a minor uh, blot in the end. I mean, it, it sh it's kind of horrifying to imagine that, like, the death of 
an entire population is a minor blot in the in the grand scheme of British history. <laughs> like when it, when there are that many bad things associated to their name, where like literal genocide in this case is kind of relegated to a footnote, but. It is kind of interesting to bring up as a poem nonetheless. Did you have anything that you wanted to say about this one in particular? Like, what does it elicit as a feeling to you? Or We see a lot, we've seen a lot of poetry like this already, you know? Mm -hmm. sure. And as you said, like, it's a minor blot. So this is one page of many, and that's, that's the most horrifying part about this poem. Yep. Then it almost any, if this was in the context of some white person dying, it probably would have gotten national coverage. Mm-hmm. But it didn't. It's a First Nations group. Yep. And so nobody cared. Nobody cared. But also, it's kind of uncommon at the time that, or at least in the 19th century, you did have a rise of like a romantic idea, but that there, he's describing them as a people to mourn, right? Whereas like you always have this idea of like white settlers describing, while, while describing natives in a romantic way, there's always a lot of subtext in these poems uh, as. Well, it's almost inevitable because that's just the march of progress. And hey, what are you going to do? Right? Are you going to you going to stop progress? Right, or like you dirty were, communist? Or they were going to like they were going to you know uh, they were going to assimilate anyway. So, but I don't get that as much in this poem. Perhaps mm -hmm. I'm sure I, I don't know again who the poet is because these. Well, I think it's anonymous. part of how the, the Bayotech weren't confrontational. There was nothing about them that was about fighting back they weren't standing they just wanted to be left alone right you know which i guess does i guess leave a leave a bit more to the imagination or at least the romantic imagination of them whereas mm. populations like the Mi'kmaq, for example or the iroquois or haudenosaunee um the they did actually have like you say confrontations with uh, with settler people. So you could very much attack them, right? Whereas the Beotuk just literally disappeared before that ever happened without, you know, there was, they were putting up a fight insofar as they kept their cultures and mm. they, they did things on their own terms. But ultimately, like you said, there's no room in this case for antagonism on the part of the British, right? They're the ones to blame. Right. right. I don't know. Um, to me, it shows like an interesting step forward, right? Um, from at least the the one um, the the painting that we the, no, that we it saw. is, and I I don't th I, again, I don't think this is bad poem, and I think it's much better than the usual. It's just mm -hmm. it's sort of sad to me that this is the norm. Yep, absolutely. It almost feels to me like the equivalent of our thoughts and prayers. Oh, interesting. Yeah, great comparison. Sending out thoughts and prayers to the Beotech people. Here's a poem. They're dead anyway, so who cares? Yeah. Yep. Let's talk about it out of, out of, after the fact. Yeah, I I didn't find much about the like much cultural um uh, like many cultural productions right. while they were dying, right? Like we said, there was, so there was the painting and stuff like that, but there wasn't much about them as a people from what I could find before that. So I think you're kind of onto something where it's a bit of a safe thing to do, mm -hmm. right? I'm not going to change like the the poem the, the poet here is not. I, I don't think he's planning on changing the world, right, with this poem. No, right? not at all. And I don't think, again, that's why it's not actually like that. But it sort mm. of, it gives me that same sort of feeling. Yeah. Where he wrote a poem after the fact. Like, this is useless now. Yeah, absolutely. Except in how it helps, like, I guess, preserve the memory of the Beotech people. I guess, yeah. So the last poem I wanted to touch upon was, yeah, the one you first mentioned, the Robert Trail Spence Lowell poem, right? Who's actually quite an interesting figure in his own right and is actually considered to be one of like the first people to write pretty decent stuff about Newfoundland, right? Um, mm -hmm. And he wrote in a collection of poems that he published in 1864, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, Yes, 1864. So on the eve of the, the Confederation debates, right, he wrote a poem, which again will be linked in the description, literally just called Newfoundland. But I, I wanted to bring this one up because, well, I'll just read part of it. Yeah. This, this, this is just exactly what you were talking about, basically. It starts like this. A rugged land, land of rock moss, land whose, whose drear barrens it is woe to cross. Thou rough thing from God's hand, O stormy land, land where the tempests roar, land where the unbroken waves rave mad upon the shore, thine outwalls scare, uh, scarce withstand, 
right? And it kind of goes on like this, right? This, a wintry realm, realm mm-hmm. where the cold north wind blows, where drifting bitter sleet and blinding snow, all man's poor work o'erwhelm, O bleak, bleak realm, whose homeward bastening bark is crisp with ice, sails cordage stiff and stark, and iced the unruly helm. What do you notice from this poem about Newfoundland? It's fucking cold. And also there's no people. <laughs> No. Yeah, that too. Except the there's, poor man at his door. Yeah, apparently, like there's this, there's one dude who's just there. <laughs> like, but like one newfie living on. And I, I I wanted to bring up this poem because Lao is kind of recognized as this important figure in bringing attention to Newfoundland, right? As a place that was you know, worthy of attention, culturally speaking, politically speaking. He's, he's like, yeah, mm-hmm. this place is actually interesting to write about. But what he's writing about is not the people or even any, like whether they're Newfoundlanders no. or not, right? He's writing about his association with the land, right? He's bringing back this idea that this is a empty, right? And I think that's a very important point. It's an empty land, right, that needs to be tamed, Right. And there's only one specific type of person who can do that. Right. And I will give listeners like three tries, but it's certainly not. I, I, or at least I very much doubt that it would be any indigenous population. Right. Um, Especially (laughs) that at at the end of the poem, he mentions, right. And better still, beneath a guardian crown, the poor man freely walks and lays him down, free in all things but ill. And better still, here holy faith hath hath come, teaching that God will give a glorious home to those that do his will. Right? There's only room for one person in Newfoundland, and that's the God-fearing man, which I guess has kind of brought us full circle (laughs) to to this evolution, right? Of there's one person who deserves to be a native of Newfoundland or one person who can kind of be called Newfoundlander, right? In the eyes of people like Lowell. I don't uh, know. That's the poor man. Yeah. Or the poor man or at least the working man, right? The pious man, <laughs> which again is kind of interesting. Poor because... man, working man, same thing. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, okay, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's, it's kind of interesting to me. I guess we can kind of, wind down right because we've been talking for a bit about this but like it's kind of interesting to me that it takes only a few generation for the Beotuk to be kind of forgotten in a sense right Mm -hmm. and that kind of depends on the type of nationalism that's being put on display right so at first it's this idea of well you know uh they were we're just a ragtag team of settlers we don't really have this association and like look what we're doing we're destroying well-established nations whereas by the time that the idea of confederation comes around like you've had time to merge under a single banner right and suddenly the kind of indigenous population becomes a symbol right or something that you can remove or manipulate right uh to your own benefit And as we'll talk about, like we're saying, once Newfoundland actually does enter Confederation in 1949, the Bayo took come back, right, as a symbol of a culture lost or a culture died, right? Um, Did Newfoundland appropriate the Bayo took? Yep, they sure did. Is this what happened? (laughs) Yeah, they exactly did. So that's where I was kind of alluding to when I said that when I when they're relegated to the status of a sign. So you know, when you think about it. The inclusion of the Beotuk as people on the Labrador and Newfoundland and Labrador coat of arms is very much indicative of that, right? They're there. They're supporting the British crown, right? Or the British, like these British symbols, right? But they're these people who are, dis- who are designed as stuck in the past, right? Mm-hmm. They have like these very uh, like primitive, quote unquote, looking garb right? They very much embody this image of a time gone by, right? And mm-hmm. they're using, they're using their, themselves to, right, to prop up these symbols of progress, these new symbols of Britishness, right? And Newfoundlandness, if you will, uh, on the coat of arms, I mean. Right? To put it in the terms that kind of got us onto this conversation in the first place, the death of the Beotuk leaves no native contradiction in Newfoundland, basically. I'm using the terms of Terry Goldie here uh, from the book that I mentioned. So like it basically mm-hmm. enables the assertion of white culture, which 
like we said, kind of faced a lot of uh, a lot of pushback, right, in the rest of Canada, right? And I'm wondering, I don't <laughs> like you, you, we saw like all kinds of rebellions from Indigenous people in the rest of Canada, which we didn't see in Newfoundland, right? So there is again no contradiction here between who's a native, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, right, going forward, and I don't know if you have any thoughts about this, but like, does this have an impact on the way that the rest of Canada, for example, saw themselves? The fact that there was a native population there that could pose a threat, right? Whereas Newfoundland did not, right? Or at least did not have one that would actively pose a threat, perhaps in their own imagination. And again, one that could be appropriated, but in terms of like tangible material reality, that wasn't a factor. I don't know if I'm rambling at this point or if you want to just save me and say something, but. <laughs> <laughs> um. I don't know. It's it, I I get your search. I see what Newfoundland is doing, and that part I think you're right. They're trying to take the Beotuk and make it into their own people and their own symbol, as like they're trying to equate themselves that way. Mm -hmm. I think it's really fucked up, though. Like, can we make that clear? Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> can, we, can we state that very categorically right now? Them saying that they are like the Beotuk is fuck to all living hell, especially considering it's most probably Newfoundland centers that led to the death of the Beatuk. Yep, absolutely. No, no, it's, it's, really, it's really wild, right? And I think it'll become more wild as we go forward. Like when we come back to this idea once Newfoundland actually does join Confederation, because, <laughs> oh boy, there, there's a lot to discuss on that one when they, actu when they actively bring in people like Shauna Dithit, like I was mentioning, into their narratives. But yeah, it's very fucked. But yeah, I, I wanted to bring that up um, as an idea. I, I don't know what to make of this ultimately, um, aside from the fact that it is really disturbing you know, in many ways. Um, yeah, I don't know. Did you have any final thoughts or anything that you wanted to add that perhaps we didn't touch upon? Um, not that I can think of. Okay. No, I'm trying. I'm sorry. I just, I'm usually like, trying to consider what else there is in the other country. I don't think so. We've hit on a lot of topics that I think you want to talk about, and that was the main thing. Yeah, This I is don't very know. much an episode you wanted to do. Yes. I'm happy to help you with your concept. I'm happy to help you realize your dream, always. Thank you. Uh, thank you for helping me realize my dreams. I, I don't know. Like Again, it was an idea to throw out. I wanted to talk about Newfoundland joining Confederation, and I realized mm -hmm. that we hadn't addressed the Beotuk, um, and I think it's important to at least give them their due as a literal extinct population, right? They represent the very fears, I guess, in a sense of a lot of indigenous populations as, the, as it existed at the time, right? Of like facing literal extinction, right? And the downfalls of that, right? I don't know. Um, on that note, I guess if you don't have anything to add, what, uh, what do we say to listeners in that sense to send us away? Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs> that's all okay great Nothing thanks for else. listening bye thanks for bye cheers <laughs> <laughs> if you want you can reach out with any questions comments or concerns on the facebook page through twitter and by email you can also support the show through paypal as a pay what you feel the show is worth and through affiliate links in the recommended reading page that i set up you can find perks like extra and ad free episodes on patreon anyway all this is optional and this show will still remain free and independent just like newfoundland Oof. <laughs> Finally, if you could leave a review on iTunes and share with some friends, it would be greatly appreciated. Yep. If you're one of our Estonian listeners, is that it? Yep. Thailand? Sure. We All thank you for dropping by again. Yeah. Spread the word. I want to be number one in Thailand one day. Nice. That's your goal? Why Thailand specifically? That's the goal. <laughs> I don't know. Just because. It'd be fun. Yeah, just because. All right. A man's okay. got to have goals. Yeah. Uh, no, absolutely. So thank you, everyone, as we were saying. So if you have like anything that you wanted to add about this like weird ass idea that I had, please do tell us because <laughs> I am genuinely yeah. curious. We, I, I, I have no... I'm not going to claim to be an expert in this subject at all. So do what, right. do what makes you happy, man. Great. Thanks. We'll, we'll do one that involves more discussion and back and forth next time. All right. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Thank <laughs> you.